Welcome everybody to the 162nd episode of the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. It's the week before opener and we had a lot of cool changes to our state record fish program and I'm super excited about it and hope everybody else is too. It's just kind of a fun program and something to entice you maybe a little bit to get out there and chase some big fish today. So today we have Manny Erickson in our fisheries operations unit coming on to talk to us about some of those changes and how this program works. So welcome, Andy. Sounds good. Thanks, Benji. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, happy to be presenting on the changes to the state record fish program. Um, my name is Mandy Erickson. I've been with DNR Fisheries for almost 26 years. Believe it or not, time flies when you're having fun. And again, I'm really excited to to be taking care of this program for DNR Fisheries and um, tell you all about the changes. So with that, uh, we'll just jump right into it. And as Benji mentioned, I'm really hoping that you've got questions. Uh, we'll save them till the end, unless you want to type something in the chat and there's staff that'll be monitoring that chat as well. But otherwise, if you've got something that you want me to address, we'll do that at the end. So jumping right on in. So we'll talk about the 2024 changes to the state record fish program. And so quickly, what we'll go through here today is a history of the program, uh, why changes were necessary in the state record fish program, what those changes are, and then we'll talk about how you actually go about uh, submitting an application for a state record fish. So prior to 2024, uh, Minnesota had two record fish categories. There was the certified weight category that was for 62 species and hybrids of harvested fish, and that was solely based on certified weights. There was also a catch and release program, and that was limited to four species, muskie, northern pike, lake sturgeon, and flathead cats. And that was strictly based on length for fish that were caught and released. Program is about 100 years old, so it's been around for a long time. It is high profile, uh, generates a ton of excitement about fishing. Uh, there's famous stories and photos all around the state. Hopefully some of you listening have visited some bait shops or restaurants or sports shops around the state that have seen replicas or the actual mounts and perhaps even a framed story of the catch uh, below that fish. So generates a lot of excitement. Um, it does also promote angling and education for a diverse set of species with that you know, 62 species that were that were open for harvest records, um, it's pretty rare for someone to actually target all those species. So it does tend to tend to get people excited about some different species. However, with all that excitement also comes some controversy. Uh, there was some issues and, and uh, discussions about the limited number of species that were recognized for catch and release records. Again, that was only four. Um, and then some of the records that had been established years back, it didn't have a lot of proper documentation. And those records, if they would have been submitted now, would have never passed our um, our current criteria. So with because of that, some of those records have been questioned publicly for, for many decades. But again, as you probably all know, uh, it does lead for some excitement and there's always conversations about, you know, I caught something bigger than the one that was the record and, and whatever it may be. So it's all part of part of the process. So again, why, why some of these changes were necessary. Some of the older records could be or should be questioned with a lack of documentation. They couldn't meet our current certified requirements. That photo on the right, uh, some of you may have scales in your tackle box and uh, the actual validity of those scales and how accurate they measure things can, can be questioned. Um, and you know, coating a rust will add on a few ounces. Um, also mindsets on harvesting large fish have changed. Regulations may not allow the harvest of large fish, and there's also more interest in targeting a wide variety of species. So DNR fisheries managers around the state have worked really hard to make sure we've got a very healthy population and we've got some amazing opportunities around the state to really target some large trophy sized fish. And again, sometimes those fish can't be harvested because of the regulations that we have. So um, allowing them to be documented as a record fish is you know, just another thing that, that went into why some program changes were necessary. So DNR formed a work group a couple years ago of a lot of staff based from different areas around the state that have a ton of different experience to look at the program and talk about some potential changes. And then these changes were launched this year. So without with that uh, group effort, there was some outreach done to interest groups around the state. Uh, media members with known interest in the topics were contacted, uh, species groups such as Muskie Zinc, Trout Unlimited, um, some social media platform. 
media coverage was also done just to try and you know get the word out that hey we're looking at changing some of these uh some programs and and uh some of these criteria just asking for feedback so star trip picked it up also wcco and outdoor news there wasn't a ton of response back um which can be looked at as either good or bad um a total of 26 comments were received so not a ton most of them did support um expansion and there was only four that really didn't like the changes that were being proposed so you know again with the with the lack of a ton of comment, but most of those are positive, DNR went ahead and, and pushed things through. So here we go. What are the changes that took place and or that are taking effect in 2024? The biggest, perhaps controversial change is that we are creating or have created a new category called non-certified records. So these records are those that were established prior to 1980 and do not have certified weights on record. So these records are now going to be referred to as non-certified in their own category, and that puts 11 species in that category. So I know this slide is kind of wordy, but it's black crappie, bluegill, brown bullheads, channel cats, common carp, flathead cats, lake trout, northern pike, smallmouth bass, walleye, and yellow perch. So again, all of those, the records that were in place for those species are going to be reopened and we'll be taking new certifications for those. Um, those will be recognized as non-certified records and um, it's we don't want to diminish the pride and the joy that, that these record holders have around these species. It's still a great fish, a great story. You know, they're likely posted in areas around the state, but we just want to make sure that these are um, opened up for new submissions that actually meet our current criteria and yet still recognize the people that caught these fish um, prior to 1980. So with certified weight category, there are now 63 species eligible for the certified weight. So if you remember from a previous slide, 62 were before, we added yellow bass and that's due to the species increase in presence and popularity, especially in the south central portion of Minnesota. So that's, again, all the 62 that were previously there, adding yellow bass, and then those 11 are opened up for, uh, for new submissions. With the catch and re release program, it used to be just the four species. Now we're adding 18 additional species that we are going to be accepting record submissions for. So again, pretty wordy, um, blue sucker, big mouth buffalo, bowfin, couple species of trout, channel cats, freshwater drum, um, bass, long nose gar, sauger, short nose gar, shovel nose sturgeon, uh, smallmouth bass, smallmouth buffalo, tiger muskie, and walleye. So that was a lot of species rattled off there pretty quick. And something that's pretty exciting is you may notice some of the more um, non uh, less popular species of, of fish, uh, native rough fish have been added um, due to their really exciting uh, increase in fishing pressure. So big mouth buffalo, freshwater drum, um, small mouth buffalo, some of those species weren't always necessarily targeted by anglers in the past, but it's, there's been a lot of interest in catching some of those uh, previously less popular species. So this is exciting that we're expanding that catch and release category to include all of these species. And then of course, we'll continue to recognize the four that were there uh, previously, muskie, northern pike, lake sturgeon, and flathead cats. So to try and uh, get going on setting some sort of minimum criteria for opening these records up, as you can imagine, uh, when new records are established, we've got to make sure that um, sizes are reasonable, or attainable, but not too attainable. So DNR staff went through uh, the long history that we have of our lake and stream survey database. That's records of length of all the fish that have been sampled through DNR fisheries surveys. And that's a database of more than 100 years of data. We also looked at neighboring state records and then the gable house length categories. And that's just a widely accepted listing of species and lengths associated with each species in terms of what would be considered a trophy fish or what would be considered a memorable fish. So looking at all those categories uh, led us to come up with some minimum length and weight categories. So if you are going after a catch and release record, the fish that you submit an application for must meet the minimum length requirement. 
So I'm not going to read all these off to you and know that these the slide is a little wordy, um, but minimum lengths are set for all those species. So if you catch a brown trout and it's only 22 inches, great fish, congratulations, take lots of pictures, but it's not worth submitting for a record fish application. Same thing for the minimum weights. Uh, we have set minimum weights for um, fish that would be submitted for the certified weight category. So again, if you're looking to submit a record for a walleye, that fish has got to be at least 14 pounds. So quick note here, if it's a fish species has a minimum weight and a, and a minimum length, the record submission does not have to meet both of them. So I, that can be a little confusing, but if you're trying to submit a fish for a certified weight and it meets the weight requirement, it does not have to meet the length requirement. So, and that can be a little confusing. If there's questions on that, we can address them at the end. So with these changes, there's been a lot of outreach efforts. Uh, a couple different examples here. Uh, the picture on the far left is a full page advertisement in the fishing regulations book this year. We did put out a large press release the last day of February of 24. Uh, the website has been updated with all new information, including our applications. And then um, it's a pleasure to join you today to talk about uh, this program on the Moss Seminar. There's also been some coverage on a few different uh, media outlets, a uh, couple new stations out of the cities, and then uh, Outdoor News ran a great article about it too. So there is some coverage, um, and it's it's neat to see all the excitement that's that uh, is surrounding this program. So what would you do if you caught a huge fish? Um, and if you're looking to know all of the details of what you need to do to, to uh, apply for a record, uh, we'll go through those right now. So of course you wanna be informed, be prepared. Make sure you have a license um, and a trout stamp. The trout stamp would be the only stamp that's required. Uh, walleye stamp is not required, but a trout stamp is required if you are fishing in Lake Superior or if you're targeting any of the trout species. Um, make sure you have a copy of the fishing regulations with you. Uh, you should know what the season dates are, what the open waters are. And then on the back of the uh, fishing regulations book, I think it's like page 84 and page 85, has all of the information about the state record fish program, including the list of what the current records are. Um, and then of course the, the open records and the non-certified weight. So great book to have, keep that with you. It's also important to make sure you have a camera with you when you're fishing. Um, and you'll also wanna have a measuring device. There are a ton of different measuring devices available. The photo I have here is just a, a quick pocket size tape measure. Um, a lot of people have bumper boards, which is like a, a half of a PVC pipe with an end on it. Um, and some, some uh, Boats have those uh, measuring tapes on them as well. A quick note with the bumper boards and any tape that you have mounted on your, on your boat, some of those measuring devices can be impacted by temperature changes. So they can shrink, they can expand, and it is a really good idea to double check them a couple times a year if you're using them for measuring. And that's both for you know, submitting a record fish, but also if you're fishing on lakes that have special regulations or slot limits or anything like that. So it's just a, a good idea to double check those because temperature can make those shrink and expand. So, and then of course, when you catch a catch a large fish, you need to decide pretty qu quickly if you can or will harvest that fish. So rules and regulations are available on the DNR website, and I don't expect you to all be able to read that, that application photo I have there, but it's just an example of what the application looks like. Applications must be sent in within 90 days of catching the fish. So it's nothing that you need to have in your tackle box or in your boat, you can just make sure you've got all the information recorded um, and then go to the website and pull out that application. So basic information that is gonna be needed for a record application is gonna be your name, contact information, your fishing license number. You'll also be asked to send in a copy of your fishing license. Um, and other pretty basic stuff, the date and location of the catch, how you were fishing, were you shore fishing or trolling or casting? Um, if it is a certified weight application, you will need to provide the certified scale information and um, where you take those fish to be measured. We'll go over this a little bit more in, in a few slides here, um, but each 
scale has a certification number on it that says someone from the, the state has been out certified that scale and it is found to be correct. So you'll need that information as well. Uh, length information for catch and release. And you'll also have to have a witness for uh, catch and release and for weighing and also for species identification. So again, all of this can be recorded without needing, without having the actual form on hand, but just know that this is the type of information that will be required on that form. So review process for catch and release. Um, if you have a potential state record catch and release fish, take as many pictures as you can. You probably um, already will, but make sure you take a lot of pictures that show the fish really, really well. Photos must be clear. Um, and we'll also, we're also going to want to see a photo of that fish being released and videos are are accepted as well. Um, I've been incredibly surprised at the number of anglers that are wearing chest cameras and videoing their entire day, which I think is fantastic and have been sent a few photo or video links that have um, the entire fish process, landing that fish and measuring it and and releasing it. And that that's a really great way, not required by any means, but but it'll work. Um, but otherwise, make sure you you photograph that fish pretty well. Make sure you're measuring it correctly. We'll talk about that again in, the, in a slide or two here. If you have some species that can easily be confused with other species, make sure any distinguishing features are clearly shown. You know, if you're looking between a muskie and a northern pike, just make sure that that color pattern is there. Um, so just make sure that you've got distinguishing features clearly shown. And then for a catch and release, you do need a witness with you. Review process for certified weight. A lot of things are similar. Uh, length measurement is ideal, but not required. Uh, the biggest thing with certified weight, that fish will have to be harvested. Um, so again, you're gonna wanna make sure with the regulations, you can harvest that fish. Uh, you need to get that fish weighed on a certified scale. So certified scales are available at most butcher shops, uh, most bait shops and grocery stores, uh, shipping stores, any place that really is important to their business to have an exact weight will likely have a certified scale. Uh, it's not a bad idea to do some recon before you're fishing in an area if you think you're going to be have the potential to get a record fish and just see if you can figure out who in your area has those certified scales. The pictures here are, are pretty old, um, but it is an example of certified scale on the bottom left. Um, if we were live in an audience, I'd ask for a show of hands on who can tell me what's wrong with that picture. But um, we want to make sure that nothing else is on that scale when the fish is weighed. So the towels that are on that scale probably add a couple ounces. Um, and without verification that that scale was zeroed or teared, um, it, it's really hard to accept a weight if the if the picture is submitted like that. So just make sure it's it's uh, weighed correctly, weighed with only the fish. And again, the fish will not be alive when it's weighed, um, so it it will you know hopefully lay still um, on a scale. Um, each certified scale should have a sticker on it as well. Um, there are some regulations about how often a scale has to be certified. If it is a grocery store, bait shop, to be properly licensed, that scale needs to be certified every three years. If it's a shipping store or anything used for mail, that actually scale has to be certified every year. So when you go to the bait shop and you check in the certified scale, uh, double check the sticker on that scale as well. And, and if it seems out of range, maybe worth uh, chatting and asking the, the bait shop owner if it's been certified lately. So um, you'll need a witness to weighing. That's often the bait shop staff or the, or the mailing store staff. And with a certified weight, record submission that fish actually has to be brought into a DNR office and on our website we have a list of all the area DNR offices there's 26 of them around the state um, it does need to be identified by two fisheries staff and just uh, to make sure you're aware that samples might be taken for a genetic test uh, there's some species that that tend to hybridize uh, specifically black crappie and white crappie and that hybrid can grow quite quickly and quite fast. And we wanna make sure 
Um, as in that example, if it's a black crappie being submitted, we want to make sure it's actually a black crappie. So genetic samples can be run pretty quickly. All we'll need is a few scales or a really small fin clip on that one, and we'll try and do it as respectfully as possible to make sure that that integrity of the fish isn't compromised. So. All right, how to measure a fish. There's a lot of um, confusion around this at times, and this is a diagram that's pulled right from the fishing regulations, so you should all have it and uh, and reference it. But for fish that can be laid on their side, which you know, most of them except sturgeon and catfish are pretty easy to lay on their side, you need to make sure that the mouth of that fish is closed and it is right at zero on a measuring tape. Um, it needs to be held flat and then have the tail pinched together as shown in that sketch. Um, the full length of a fish must be visible on the measuring device. It can be zoomed out pretty far, but with a decent quality photo, we'll be able to zoom in and make sure that, that we can see that there's no jumps in the measurement on that tape and, uh, and nothing looks odd. Um, with sturgeon or catfish, you wanna make sure their snout is right up against zero on that scale or in that measuring tape, and then push the tip of the tail down as shown in that in that image. Couple images of uh, what not to do, perhaps, is some, some creative ways that people have measuring fish. And some of these have been submitted for records and uh, not accepted because of the way that they were measured. So the sturgeon pictures are among my favorite. Um, this one on the far left is, you know, the tape starts way down below the snout and the tape goes up and over the back and down to the fish. So that measurement, perhaps not accurate. Um, the other sturgeon one here shows starting in the right spot, but all around the side of the fish. And, and again, not accurate here. Um, this one, it's hard to tell where the zero is on the snout. Um, so, you know, again, taking multiple pictures is really helpful. You're never going to get a perfect picture in your first shot. So don't be afraid to take and submit a bunch of different pictures. The one on the bottom here is actually from a chest camera, a still picture taken from a chest camera. But with the strategic placement of water drop or fog on the lens, the critical measurement of where that tail is, you, you can't see it. Um, and then again, with the, with the muskie on the far right, you can't see where the, the snout of that fish is. So take a ton of pictures. Um, you know, generally anglers love to brag about their catch and I love to look at all the pictures of great fish. So uh, don't be afraid that you're taking too many. And sadly, any questionable or incomplete submissions have to be denied. So once a record is, um, submitted and it's found to be great. We've checked all the things, the license was valid, the trout stamp was in place, whatever it may be. Um, you'll get an official letter from me recognizing that this is a new uh, record uh, record submission and you'll get a really cool plaque like the one that's shown here on the photo. And we're still working through how we're going to strategically release press releases and social media updates with all of these submission categories open and potential new record submissions. We don't wanna flood the media with every day having a new record fish submission. So we're trying to do it a little more strategically. There'll be a large release uh, shortly after the fishing opener with new records that have been established. And then we're also looking at a couple key dates throughout the summer to release some of the information, likely around the 4th of July, somewhere more towards the end of summer. Uh, perhaps around Labor Day and then a few throughout the winter. So look for some of these press releases to come out in in masses. And hopefully there's there's a bunch of interest in this. There already has been. So um, so I expect that to continue as our fishing seasons open here in the next few weeks. Um, hopefully social media updates will be a little more frequent um, with with our DNR processes. Sometimes it's it's difficult to get things out real quick, but we're still working on some of this. So submissions being reviewed so far in 2024. These are some submissions that have come in uh, just to show some neat pictures of people that are out there doing it already this year. We have one for a black crappie that's been submitted. We've got a great photo of a lake trout that's being submitted and perhaps one of the shortest records ever on on record. Uh, we had shovel nose sturgeon. Two submissions came in. The one on the left um, met the minimum length requirement for this catch and release record and was able to hold the record for a whopping four days before it was beat by the fish on the right. So a lot of excitement going on here already and, and it's been really fun to be involved in this program.
So with that, catch a big one, make sure you document it correctly. And I hope there's a bunch of questions. So thanks for letting me share all this with you and uh, good luck fishing. Thanks, Mandy, that was great. We got some good questions coming awesome. in here. Then Andrew, ironically, just a few slides ago, you had the the plaque you showed. Yeah. It was of a shovel and old sturgeon. And Andrew, I don't know if you've caught this one or not, but he's asking how quickly can we expect to see submissions posted or approved? Say a 35 inch no shovel nose sturgeon. Right. Um, as I mentioned, it's it's gonna be tough to get a lot of these records out. Um we're hoping that review goes pretty quickly. Sometimes it's a little harder to get verification of all of the fields needed. Um, there's gonna be a lot of back and forth with emails and fishing license photos and species verification. So hopefully as we do this more often, the process will get pretty quickly or pretty, pretty fast. Sorry for my stumbling of words, but hopefully within you know a couple of weeks to a month is, is um, likely to be expected it does take a while to get the plaques ordered they have to be made by our, our vendors um, but when we work through the process of getting social media updates i'm hoping it'll be a little quicker awesome and hopefully everybody has a chance to write down your email there i yes. also did put the page um, for the dnr page in the chat so you Great, can find these information there too yep. if you want to pull your presentation down you can do that uh, Jill was asking, and this is a great point, when a fish can't be harvested, does that mean it can't be eaten? So what's the difference between fish that can be harvested and then other fish that we have to catch and release? So it, if it can't be harvested, it can't be eaten? Did I hear that correctly? Can you repeat that one? Sorry, Benji. When a fish can't be harvested, does that mean it can't be eaten? So I'm thinking like a, a sturgeon in the Minnesota River, there's no... Um, you're not allowed to harvest that fish. You're not allowed to keep it and eat it. Right. It's a catch and release only. Yes. So, yes. So yep. A little clarification so in, on that. Yeah. In those cases, you would only be able to submit for a catch and release catch catch and release record on that fish. And that's part of you know why making sure having that fishing regulations book with you and knowing what the regulations are, where you're fishing is really important because we will double check the the season dates and the location where that fish was harvested. And the length as well. Right. And James, and I think Andrew had kind of the same question here, which is is a great question I didn't think of, but um, looking at having Lake Superior as a separate record from smaller streams. So if you're chasing after trout, there's a difference between lake trout and stream trout. Is that something, I guess they do that in Wisconsin? And yeah, and that's something that the DNR work team did look at. Um, we did decided to not go with that for a number of reasons, but the main one being that there's a lot of different portions of the state that have very unique fisheries and trying to separate just Lake Superior out would have also raised the case for separating out, you know, muskies on some of our great musky lakes. So having lake specific records, uh, the catfish in the Red River is a great example that the Red River has the ability to grow enormous catfish, um, bigger than you would find in other areas of the state. But uh, we decided not to go with individual lake records and more just on statewide records. Okay. Thank you. Uh, James, again, was wondering how often will new records be reported and where will they be posted? So we're working on that. It'll be press releases gone out. So when DNR does press releases, they are released to the general media, um, which outlets pick them up is not always under our control, but most often the, 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 uh, you know, outdoor news will almost always pick things up. Star Tribune will pick things up quite a bit. Uh, the bigger news stations will. A lot of the local stations will as well, um, but it will go out in a mass news release. And then again, whoever picks it up is, is beyond DNR's control. We will also be putting out social media updates. So watch for that on, on all the social media platforms. And as this is a new program and we're, you know, likely going to be dealing hopefully dealing with a lot of interest uh, we are going to stagger these releases out a little bit so the first one with hopefully a couple of submissions will come out right after the fishing opener and then again we'll look around the fourth of july to do another one um and uh again towards the middle of summer and then we'll work through the winter but you will like if you have a record fish you'll likely receive the letter and the plaque um prior to that 
press release going out and um, some people may do some self promoting and contact their local agencies or bait shops or whatever it may be. And that's totally fine too. be excited about it. It's, it's a neat thing. I'd be proud. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Andrew sounds like he is a person that likes to get out and chase record fish. So I think you just answered his question. He was wondering about where he can find information before it's posted to the public, follow us on social media, do yep. those type of things. Um, and, you know, he doesn't want to go after a fish that of records that have already been set, but right. this is this is new. This, this is, is new. It's, I think it's it might be, super be a busy. little clunky. Yep, it's going to be a little clunky. Um, I do have quite a few other job responsibilities. Sadly, this isn't my only one, so it is you know admittedly potential to be a little clunky this this summer. So have patience with us. If you have a species in mind, call me. Send me an email. I'll say you know, hey, is what's the is the record been broken for? whatever fish you're after, and I'll, I'll happily get back to you on that one. Yeah. But hopefully and, it won't And be if you have a fish story. that potentially could be, just make sure you document it and send it to Mandy and find out. Absolutely. That's the best way to probably yeah. to do it because like that shovel nose sturgeon, it only lasted four days, the first record, so. Right. right. Mm -hmm. can, that's where the records to be broke, right? Exactly. And if I had, if I had to guess, you know, which record would have gone down first, that shovel nose surgeon was not in my, not in my wheelhouse of guessing. But um, talking to some anglers that target shovel nose sturgeon, the the minimum length set on that, I believe, was thirty four, and there was a lot of people that said, "Oh yeah, that's attainable, no problem." So, and that was the first one to get to be broken. I'm kind of expecting yellow bass to fall soon too. That's a one pound minimum, and I. I know there's some groups out there targeting those, so that's that's my guess on which one will go next. But you never know; it makes it makes it fun to check email in the morning and and see who caught what. So, if anybody has any other questions, you know, please get them in the Q and A. There, be happy to get to them. So, I'm just trying to figure out if Mandy has like an office pool, you know, like where. <laughs> What fish is going to be next and what time frame? I do not. I do not. No, and but we could. brownies resting on this? Or... We could. <laughs> it good. has been really interesting to, to hear so much feedback from a lot of the people that have been recording fish info within some of the apps that are out there. DNR isn't affiliated with any of the fishing apps that that a lot of you may be using. Um, that being said, a lot of the information that you would be loading into those apps to record your catch um, can also be sent to DNR, but just know that we don't have access to any of those. We're not affiliated with any of the apps and um, whatever information you're you're submitting in one place, you likely will have to submit somewhere else. So um, it's been really fun to get a lot of people's links to YouTube channels. I've learned more about fishing channels on YouTube through some of these uh, submissions that people have sent in. And, and it's been really fun to see all of the excitement. And I've been in fish management for a long time, and this is just a different view of it, that it's really fun to almost be able to see the the satisfaction and the work that fisheries managers around the state are doing by watching the anglers get excited about this and and knowing that you know, that's it's work all gone to uh, really promote a great hobby and uh, great businesses within the state of Minnesota. So fishing is pretty important across the state of Minnesota and we're super lucky to have the amount of fishing available. I mean, probably, you know, the best in the country as far as I'm concerned for the amount of species and opportunities we have in the state of Minnesota. And I did put a link to, I don't know if you remember that webinar, Mandy, that I think Corey did it. It was like episode 53. It was on catching rough fish, yeah. fishing for rough fish, I think it was called. So I put a link to that in the chat. That was a great episode too. And Cassie just threw one in there too on how to handle some of these large fish when you catch them. So that's a, especially going after these catch and release records, you know, make sure you get your hands wet, make sure you're not picking them up by the jaw and holding them appropriately. So I right. believe that was episode 119, if I remember right, but um, yeah, that's, check, that's check really those links out things. and watch those. Yeah, really great thing. Make sure you've got the right gear if you know what you're going after. It, it never seems to fail though. And I know I did this when I was little, I caught a really big fish and uh, all we could find for a stringer was a shoelace in the trunk of the car. So I mean, if when you're not prepared, that's when you're gonna catch a nice fish, but if you know you're going to be targeting these fish, make sure you're prepared. Have the appropriate gear. Have a landing net. Have you know a way to protect that fish. You don't want it bouncing around on the bottom of your boat 
or bouncing around on the gravel on the shoreline. Just try and try and play that fish well and quickly when it's when it's being landed, uh, handle it appropriately in the boat and get it back to the water as fast as you can for these catch and release fish. Great. Our friend Jeff had a couple of questions in here too. Uh, one of them, just on your opinion, which of the new records do you think will be the hardest to set? Oof. Little office pool forming right now. Right, and you know what? I, I I'm going to defer answering that one because I think there are so many different angler groups that are actively involved in targeting some of these really unique species. And it, you know, it, it used to be catching just to you know get a meal of fish or fishing just to get a meal of fish or whatever it may be. But there's so many people running species lists and trying to go after the master angler certification in Minnesota that's run through the Fishing Hall of Fame. And there, there's just such a diverse mix of people that are targeting different species that for me to just pick one species, I don't think it'll do justice to all the people that are really going after. Like you mentioned, Corey and all the rough fishing, um, you know, the the standard four of the walleye, the pike, the muskie, the sturgeon. I mean, those are almost seemingly not the popular ones anymore because so many people are just diversifying their their fishing. And it's really exciting to see. And it speaks volumes towards, you know, the habitat management in Minnesota and what we're doing with uh, fish movement in rivers and making sure that we've got the communities to support these the fish um, in all of these different resources. So I'm going to respectfully decline answering that one because I, I think it's it's just a it's a mix of everybody's different opinions on this one. You did a fantastic job not answering that actually because <laughs> you, you answered Jeff's next question, which was about the master. I can't answer. <laughs> Minnesota does have a master angler program. And it's yeah. not run through the DNR. It's run Correct. through the Minnesota Fishing, the Fishing Hall of Fame. Is that yeah. what it is? Minnesota Fishing Hall of Fame, which is a really cool program. There's a couple different variations on it, so uh, we can uh, throw a link to that in the chat too. The Minnesota Fishing Hall of Fame and check into that master angler program. And you know, you mentioned multiple species too, and our next week fishing opener next weekend so next week live from the dock we are meeting out there with uh, the president of the minnesota anglers Minis women anglers of minnesota and her friend katie and I, I talked to katie the other day and she is chasing like all these species she's got like 100 species of fish she's caught in minnesota already and i'm like that's that's amazing to me that we can even have that many species but that she's gone out there and that's like her quest is to go out there and catch all these species of fish, which is kind of a really a fun, unique thing to do. Yeah, and there's I've heard that there's micro anglers that are after like the minnow species, trying to catch all yep. the all the minnow and the non-game species. So yeah, I mean it it's fantastic. People's level of interest and and the diversity of of hobbyists out there is really incredible. Do we have any record smallest fish categories for those micro anglers? Where if anybody out there listening, we we're talking about doing a micro fishing. Um, webinar here over the summer sometimes. So if anybody's out there, a micro fisher and wants to join one of our webinars, shoot me an email, but yeah. you'll have to come up with like the smallest fish. Right, let's get through this big rollout first <laughs> before we uh, look at expanding. But you know, that's 2029. Means this, this is a, a huge program change. Most changes that have been done in quite a few years, but by no means does this mean that there won't be future changes to the program. So, um, not promising anything about microfish or anything like that, but it's very likely that additional species could be added in the future for catch and release, especially. Um, and it, it'd be great to see the interest in this program grow and uh, to see some of the coverage and uh, participation in the program increase as well. That's great. I just snuck one more question in there for us. Uh, is it true to target big fish, you should fish big water? No, not always. No, uh, the the biggest uh, thing to be aware of in terms of targeting variety of waters with the state record fish program. If you are fishing on some privately stocked farm pond where you've purchased fish and have the stocking permit and and have you know been feeding them, those fish caught out of those private ponds are not eligible for state records. So any state record submission has to be caught on a body of water that has public access. And that doesn't mean a big fancy paved boat ramp. It just means that 
the body of water or the stream that you caught that fish in has to be accessible by all members of the public and not just a, a private stock pond or anything like that. But um, big fish often don't grow in the big, big waters, um, especially at different times of the year when they're searching out different habitat types for spawning. Um, fish are going to be in places that, that you may be really surprised. Um, since I've been in fisheries, one of the most amazing things that have shocked and shocks me every year I see it is those dog days of summer, how many large walleyes are hiding out in shallow water under the lily pads, sitting there eating away and enjoying all the oxygen that's put out by those plants. So that surprises me every time I see it with you know, shallow water, lily pads and walleyes in the summer. Good to know. Mark that in my calendar. Right. <laughs> Um, I think that's all the questions we had. Great, we thanks. The micro fishing, we got everything else was covered. I put a couple of those in the chat for everybody. So click on those. Um, like I said, next week, the 163rd episode, we're doing it live from the dock out in Minnetonka. We're doing some um, just how to fish seminars, working about you know how you get started, maybe what your next rod and reel should be if you want to get a little bit better or do some improvements. So Michelle and Katie are gonna join us out there live on the dock. So look forward to that. Hope everybody has a wonderful and safe weekend and get out there and enjoy the lovely weather today at least and uh, get some fishing. So thanks Great. everyone. See you next week. Thank you.